as a coach, I'm always upping my game because I know that the better I do in my life, the more I can serve my clients. Welcome, everybody. This is For the Love of Money, where we are making you unapologetic about your pursuit of success by sharing the tools, tips, and stories of those who have already made it. My name is Chris Harder, and each week I will bring you incredible guests in order to prove that when good people make good money, they do great things. Hey, everybody, welcome back to another amazing episode of For the Love of Money. I cannot wait for you to hear today's episode because I'm sitting down with my friend, Alyssa Nobriga. Now, she's an entrepreneur, a speaker, a leader in the coaching and consciousness industry, and she is crushing it. When I say crushing it, I mean, of course, she has the multiple seven-figure business, and of course, she's changing lives left and right. And of course, she's getting lots of recognition for it from Entrepreneur Magazine and Fox News and YPO, and she was on Deepak Chopra's show and... Forbes and like she's everywhere. But that's not what I mean when I say she's crushing it. What I mean is she just came and spoke at my elite level mastermind a couple days ago. And by the time she was done, she had removed so many limiting beliefs, so many money blocks that even my elite level entrepreneurs that I work with had. She rocked that room. And so when it was all done, I got to the back of the room and I said, you have to be on my show and we have to have these conversations for everybody to hear. And so that's what we're doing for you today. You are about to hear some very in-depth conversations about money mindset and the difference between a coach and a therapist. Because by the way, she spent several years practicing therapy as a marriage and family therapist, has two different master's degrees, one in clinical psychology and one in mind-body psychotherapy. And so she's lived on both sides of that fence, therapist versus coach. And she actually has blended the two to be one of the most powerful, mind-shifting difference makers that you could ever come across. And that's why I have her on the show. I wanted you all to have a shift by the end of this episode, the way those in my Elite Level Mastermind did. You know, if you ever wanted to peek into my elite level mastermind, this is going to be a, a really good opportunity to see the level of individuals that I have come and, and work with them privately in a very intimate setting. They come and they, they shift their lives in business and they shift their mindset and they shift what's possible for them and they lift the curtain and they reveal all the secrets just like Aly- Alyssa did. And so if you're curious, if you want to check out my elite level mastermind so that you can learn from epic individuals like Alyssa and everybody else who I had come speak this week, then I want you to go check it out at fortheloveofmoney.com forward slash mastermind. Fortheloveofmoney.com forward slash mastermind. Now, here's why I'm encouraging you to go check it out. First of all, this is only for people making over $500,000 a year. This is the elite level mastermind. We teach you how to get into the multiple, multiple seven figures by locking arms for one year. But now here is the challenging side. The reason I'm encouraging you to rush over there and go is we have decided to keep this group very small and very intimate. We're making it smaller than it was last year, and we're capping it at 29 high-level entrepreneurs. It's a very small number for a group like this. Now, why am I doing that? Well, is is it going to make me less money? Yeah, absolutely. But does it allow me to go even deeper with each person? Yeah. And that's what I'm craving to do in 2020 is to go deeper with each and every one of them. Now, we locked arms and we did a lot of work together in 2019, but I added a whole new layer by adding a monthly one-on-one coaching call to each mastermind member at that level. So this thing is now the most powerful program for entrepreneurs on the freaking planet. I can promise you that. So if you're an entrepreneur making over $500,000 a year and you want to lock arms with us in 2020, I want you to go to fortheloveofmoney.com forward slash mastermind. But don't wait because out of the 29 spots, 19 of them renewed from last year. What does that tell you? So not many spots to fill. I'm going to have a lot of conversations to find the right 10 individuals for the, to join this existing 19 that renewed for 2020. Go check it out. Fortheloveofmoney.com forward slash mastermind. I can't wait to have a phone call with you, chat about your business, and see if we together are a perfect fit. So with no other delay, 
I want you to really tune in. I want you to really get present because Alyssa Nobriga is one of those people that in my life, if I really need someone to, to lift the lid off of what I'm doing, to take the cap off of what I think is possible, she's one of those people in my life that I'm blessed to be able to turn to. And that's what she's about to do for you. Everything from parenting tips to how you, how you should raise your kids when it comes to money mindset as a successful parent to doing a deep dive on limiting stories, you're in for a treat. So listen up, get ready, because here we go. Alyssa, thank you so freaking much for being on the show. I knew when I saw you speak to my mastermind this past week, I had to get you on ASAP because you rocked that room. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, I can't wait to see where this conversation goes. Now, I start all my conversations with rapid fire. It's just kind of a a fun way for my listeners to get to know you in a hurry. And then if something really good comes up, I promise we'll circle back around and do a deep dive on it. Sound good? Awesome. Perfect. All right. So I'm going to start real easy. Where'd you grow up? Northern California, Bay Area. And where do you live now? In Los Angeles. I mean, I know you're my neighbor, but the listeners don't know you're my neighbor. One mile away. We live one mile away. (laughs) Uh, What's your favorite quote? You are what you're looking for. Mm, Yeah, isn't that the truth? What is one of your superpowers? My intuition. Ah, what's one of your favorite books? A New Earth. What is one thing you're challenged by right now? Letting people help me. You and me both. What, um, (laughs) that's always been a challenge of mine. What's one (laughs) of your most proud accomplishments so far? My marriage. Oh, so cool. And you guys have such an awesome one too. And what is something generous you've recently done? I uh, a sales call that I just did. Yeah, I go, I go, I go above and beyond on those calls to genuinely let them know if I think I can support them, and then I give them tools. So just got off of a sales call, and I'll give them tools if I don't feel like I can. I absolutely love that your answer to something generous you've done recently is the sales call you just did where you're selling something. Yeah. I cannot wait to yeah. circle back around on that because what, yeah. what a cool positioning of that. Most people would see selling one of their products, not as generosity, but as, as their gain. Yeah. So no, that's super I, cool. I, don't, I know what it can do for them. Yeah. That's so cool. All right. And last but not least, what are you grateful for today? This moment, connecting yeah. with you. Thank you. You and me both. So let's mm-hmm. go a little bit deeper. Um, okay. You are clearly passionate about coaching entrepreneurs at a very, very high level. Uh, You do it in your mastermind. You do it one-on-one. And if anybody has the right to be out there coaching entrepreneurs at a high level, it's you because you have two different master's degrees. You've built the business yourself. You've been there, done that at a a multiple high seven-figure level. And you've shifted over into this coaching world where you wanted to accelerate other people's journeys. So why is this work important to you? Mm. I feel like not only do I feel like I have the best job in the world because I get to enhance my life and then support others in doing the same for themselves, but I feel so honored and privileged to have people feel safe to go deep and be real and help them get free and really create the life of their dreams. So you were a licensed therapist, um, both a spiritual psycho in spiritual psychology, right? And yep. in family psychology, clinical, clinical, clinical psychology. It was somatic based, meaning body centered. So I did both body and spirit, and obviously I do mindset work. All right. So I'm so curious. There's this this debate out there in the world of a licensed therapist who did the work and got the masters and you know spent the money and got the training, and then all of these coaches and yeah. anyone can call themselves a coach, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Explain to me the difference between a true licensed therapist Mm -hmm. and a coach because you've actually worn both hats. Yeah, great question. And just to simplify it, so a lot of the times therapists, psychotherapists, are looking in the rear view of a car. They're looking at the past and they're helping them heal. Sometimes people aren't functional. So they're talking about diagnoses or um, substance abuse, things that, that really help them live a functional, healthy life. And as a coach, you're looking out of the front of the car. So you're looking f- towards the future, helping somebody create change. Now, you're not necessarily going to the past for the past sake. I somewhat combine the two in the sense where I empower my clients to learn the life hack tools so that they feel empowered to go for a big risk with me and create a goal that they want while clearing anything subconsciously that's blocked them around that goal. 
Mm. So I'll combine the two in relation to the goal, but I'm also empowering them and people that I work with are high functioning and they're really looking to go from good to great rather than not being able to be functional in the world. I actually got to see you do this at my mastermind a couple of days ago. And something that really intrigued me that I wanted to ask you about was you brought the whole room back to when they were six. I think you yeah. said six years old, right? Yeah, I did. Okay, yeah. So you said, I want you to go back to when you were six years old and then you had a series of, of questions for them. Mm-hmm. Could you kind of take us back there and then also explain why did you take us all to six years old? Yeah, great question. So oftentimes our original programming was set when we were up until around six. So what life meant, if it is it safe, can I trust people? I went back to take your mastermind group to, and it was a meditation to come back to their original childhood home and explore what did I learn about what money was from my mom and from my dad so we could collect the subconscious stories that are actually driving and running us now. Because if we're not conscious of it, we could have the foot on the gas and the brake saying, I want to make more money. But if it's like, hey, it's not safe to make more money or if my dad failed at business and then if he, I, he took the risk and failed, I'm going to fail. So then we have to unravel that so that you feel really behind yourself and have your energy to be present and be productive moving forward. So a lot of the time, it's just about... And what I shared with your audience was, if you want to go faster, slow down Mm -hmm. with the mindset work. Really, we have our own wisdom and answers. And as we slow down to listen, we highlight what is actually running us in a subconscious way. Sometimes we're aware of those things and oftentimes we aren't. But if we slow down enough, we can find what is the competing intention that's driving us so that we can take the lever off the brake and really move forward powerfully on our dreams. So obviously don't use anyone's names, but can you give us an example where you worked with somebody and you got them to slow down to speed up? Because this is so hard for me and it's so hard for a lot of people. Uh, You know, I I know intuitively it's the right thing to do, but I also know I could just muscle it out and I could just try harder (laughs) and I could just add another product and I could do these other things that will also bear fruit. And so I have a real hard time with slowing down to speed up. So give us a good juicy example. Yeah. So this is a good one that I use often because it's just very clear. So I was working with a woman who wanted to double her leadership team and her income. And she had worked with a lot of clients and she just kept hitting this invisible glass ceiling. And she couldn't make the million dollar mark. She was at like 800 or so. And and she said, I've tried all the things and I just can't get there. So like exhaustion and suffering sometimes has an intelligence in us yeah. in it. So we look for a different way. So she found me and I said, one fear you have of making more money is... And she's like, I have no fears of making more money. And I said, okay, really slow down. There, every, everything in our lives actually thinks it's helping us. But there's a positive intention in all of it. If we can find what that is, we can let go of the ineffective parts of it. And we can talk about that, how it shows up with inner critic and all these other things. But... With this woman, I said, okay, if you make a million dollars, you fear what? And she said, oh, when I saw my mom get a raise, my, my, my parents divorced at that same time. And so she subconsciously thought that if she made more money, she would have a weak relationship or she would lose her husband. I've had other women say, oh my God, I'd make more than my husband. Not even knowing this, I'd make more than my husband. And what would that mean for our marriage? Mm-hmm. Change the dynamic. Would he feel like a man, the provider? Would you know? Would I feel resentful? All these things, when we're really honest, our own wisdom comes up with it. And so highlighting what those subconscious blocks are helps us actually question them. And then make sure, okay, I want a strong marriage and I want to make more money. How do I honor those two values consciously rather than unconsciously putting on the brakes? Mm. It's fascinating because... I can see that subconscious layer once you explain it of, oh, I don't want to emasculate my husband by earning more, or maybe yeah. I don't want to make my parents feel bad by earning more or whatever their story or is. Or would I fit in with them? Exactly. How yeah. are other people going to see me if I move outside of this um, family system or the structure of who I've known myself to be? Because the ego will always project fear into the unknown. So it finds safety and security in the known, even if the known is toxic in playing small. Mm -hmm. And so really starting to get mindful and questioning, is small necessarily safe? Mm -hmm. And is it comfortable? And being willing to test it out. I always tell people, don't believe me, but be willing to test it and see for yourself. And so I'll give people little bite-sized experiments or for a day, 24 hours, maybe one week to test something different out because that's where you create new neural nets and Mm -hmm. that's where your life changes. Let's stay on the subject a minute because sometimes your family dynamic does change when you start making a lot more than them. 
Yes. Or sometimes your husband does feel emasculated mm-hmm. if you're making mm-hmm. more than him. Um, and there, people really struggle with that. So yeah. sometimes the fear is real. It's not yeah. just there you know, on a false pretense. What does somebody do when they wake up? And you know, sure enough, they power through, they, they transcend to that next level and everybody around them is reacting differently. Well, there's a few things. One is like those reactions, those new patterns are going to hurt in the beginning, Mm -hmm. potentially. And there may be people where we think that they're going to judge us and they actually don't. So there's that potential. But if somebody, if I were working with somebody and they said, I I know what that risk is and I really want to take it. I want to honor myself and I want to have people in my life that really see me and celebrate me. And knowing that as you move forward, other people will be called forward to play at their best. And if not, that's not your responsibility because there is because otherwise we just play small out of the fear that people aren't going to like our growth. Mm -hmm. And so you can either grow and give people permission to have their experience of you however they do, and or it calls them forward into what they're capable. Like if you're if one partner's growing, the other partner's either it's gonna highlight the other partner's pain and playing small and they're gonna feel resentful, or it will inspire them to take their next step. And for me, and as a former couples therapist, it was like, okay, arguments are going to happen, but how do you grow stronger together? Okay, you're going to change over time, but how do you grow together? And so developing those muscles, if that's what's important, is something that you can work on. But both, you have to be willing and it's ultimately up to you to make the choice. And do I want to play small and give my life to other people's opinions or am I going to stay true? And no good or bad answer, but making the decision I think sets us free. Yeah, I totally agree. Now, you just mentioned that you were a couples therapist in the past and, and it's a great segue into another question I wanted to ask you. I feel like the number one stress in households is typically money. And mm-hmm. the number one stress in relationships is typically money. Even if people mm-hmm. don't think it is, they could probably trace back to the fact that it's the underlying stress. Mm-hmm. Talk to me about money in relationships. Yeah, I think money is a big topic because... And most people aren't talking about it. So I love that this whole podcast is bringing light to some of these shadow things, especially because a lot of this stuff that we've inherited around money was really um, over generations, right? Where it's like, we, you know, some of our ancestors went through the Great Depression. So we did certain things that we haven't even questioned. We still need to be doing them, right? And so I often find, yes, money is a big trigger for people because there's not been enough looking at it and bringing it to the light. But I also think that there's an underlying thing that it's about where it's it's money is a scapegoat for it, but there's even something deeper. Or maybe it's about power, or maybe it's about worth or boundaries, or and so may and same with sales calls. Like, you know, people say I can't afford it. Oftentimes it's not about that. It's about the deeper thing. And if you can serve them around the deeper thing, or in your relationship, if you can talk about that deeper thing, not only are you more free around that topic, but you can move forward to create your life consciously in the way you really want. So how can couples really put this on the table and, and work through it in a responsible way? Because here's what happens. One person finally has the courage to bring it up and it turns into a, a big fight, right? yeah, like a big pissing match. How can <laughs> couples really work through this? Or do they need to go work with someone like yourself? Well, I think it. De- I I always love an unbiased party, so I am biased towards liking somebody to hold space for my husband and I, and we do it proactively. Obviously, I love couples wow. therapy, so we do it once a month or every other week as a way for maintenance to be like, how do we go from good to great? And and I so I do value that, but not everybody has to do that. If something feels triggered, then I would say get a coach or a therapist to support you through it. But it's less about the what and more about the how. And so. When somebody has an emotional trigger, whether it be your children or your partner, whether it be about money or something else, first mirror them emotionally. So I really get that you're mad or I get this is really frustrating because it drops defenses. You're, I can see you. I'm with you. That's what you're saying. And then you can talk about some of the practicals. So once they feel seen and heard, then you can say, and you mirror to them, I, this is your point of view that I'm understanding. Is that right? So do perception checking mm-hmm. and then say... This is what I value. How and then be collaborative. How do we work together to find a middle ground? Because oftentimes couples attract the opposite. Mm-hmm. One person's probably not very planning oriented or maybe spends a lot, and the other was being conservative and plans, right? So we attract the opposite because oftentimes we have undeveloped parts of ourselves mm-hmm. that we're attracted to. 
Mm. I love how free my husband is with money. He loves how conservative I am with money. So we balance each other out, but we have an opportunity to not judge them. We actually were attracted to them and to help develop those parts of ourselves so we're both well-rounded. And so it's more about mirroring them emotionally first, letting them feel seen and heard, sharing what they're saying is important to them, and then being collaborative. Here's what's important to me and how do we work together on this? And then creating a plan. And I think that's a good recipe for almost any conversation. Mm-hmm. All right, we're now work us through the creating the plan part. Because if we do what you just said, we're probably going to get to that part where we realize, oh, hey, I love you because you're so free with money or actually free with life. And you bring yeah, out that free right. spirit in me. But it also means that you're pretty free with money. And yeah. here I am, you know, squirreling it away, trying to protect it. So yeah. you reach that point of realizing it that you appreciate that about each other, but you still have very two opposite views of what you should do with money. So, so yeah. what comes next? Yeah. So every, I would say every plan is going to be different depending on the values of the couple. And what I love that you're bringing up is that you're doing the inside work before the outside. So instead of trying to come up with a plan from a totally divided, heart, heated art argument, really dropping into your hearts, connecting as a couple in love, and then being able to come up with a specific plan. And both partners, and obviously, the, we even have two sides, like the, the devil inside of us, the devil and the angel. How do we actually come to harmony within ourselves? The same principles apply outer and inner. Mm-hmm. So if I've got an opposing position inside of me, the same principles apply. But um, every specific plan is going to be different for each couple. Because some may be like, I'm not willing. Here's the non-negotiables, and here are the things I'm willing to, to lean into. And maybe you just come up with a plan where you test it out for a month. Or you can say, you know, this is what feels good for me. And, but every specific plan will be different depending on what the values and the arguments are with each couple. So it's possible to coexist with you know, one person wanting to spend freely and not be you know, in the constraints of a budget and the other person really yeah. being budget oriented. It's possible to coexist that way. 100%. 100%. And I would say most entrepreneurs value freedom. That's why they went into entrepreneurship. But a lot of people have bought into this societal misunderstanding that money gives me freedom mm-hmm. or money gives me security. I get it on a relative level. But if we play that game in life, we're victim to money. Mm-hmm. And we're always looking outside of ourselves. We're outsourcing our well-being. Mm-hmm. And so one of the tools and tricks would be to go direct. Rather than looking for money to give it to me, how do I create that safety and that freedom inside of my experience in this moment? Because safety can never come in the future. The future always changes. How do I drop in, create that safety or that freedom inside myself or inside my marriage? Because if that's what I really value, mm-hmm. then how do I do that in my relationship? And use money as an expression for that. And I would also encourage couples and even individuals get clear on what your values are, so that you can ex- you can express and spend money in a way that you're you're in alignment with your values. That's okay. Now let's take this to children, because obviously yeah. you're a mother. Uh, I shouldn't mm-hmm. say obviously. Audience doesn't know that. So now they know you're a mother, <laughs> and uh, you and your husband Emilio are very very highly successful individuals. How do you want your children to view money growing up? This is a good conversation. <laughs> Yeah, consciously. So what I mean by that is to... And this is a conversation that is ongoing because our, our, our oldest, start, we started hearing that she was worried about money. Mm-hmm. And it was like, oh, okay. So what are, her, what are the stories she's bought into about what money is and what can happen? And so we've taught her something called the work. And that's a, a, a anybody can look it up, thework.com. I find it really powerful in terms of mindset work. And so we teach her to question her stories about life. Mm-hmm. So, you know, anything. And so taking her power back from any limiting beliefs that she has around her body, around money, anything like that. And so it's more about a, a conversation with her and just keeping us just being honest about our experiences and us doing our own work more than what we tell her, mm-hmm. I think is the real teaching. And so we try to just live by example and have open, honest conversations with the kids. We, I, I want to start implementing like a, a family meeting, maybe once a, meet, a month, just to talk about things that may get shoved under the rug or other agendas come up. Um, we haven't done that yet. But yeah, we're still figuring it out around money. Yeah. And obviously, we want her to feel empowered, but we're still figuring it out. <laughs> I forget. She's 14? She's 14, yeah. yeah. So I mean, to even be worried about money at 14 mm-hmm. is... I, I think we forget that kids worry about these things that early. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, it took me by storm when you said, I'm like, wait, at 14 years old, I already worried about it. And yeah. so it's, it's very important to address it. 
Now you live in, you know, the most beautiful neighborhood and the most beautiful home and, and the neighborhood that we live in together here. We see uh, high school kids with Ferraris and, you know, like all the, just over the top stuff. Mm-hmm. How mm-hmm. do you raise a kid around such privilege and still have them have the values and the moral compass and everything that you want them to have when they turn out as an adult? Yeah. I think some parents, I would say like guard their children from that. And we would just rather empower ours with the tools and be in all types of life. And that, you know, she was living a really privileged life and there there's, we have to be mindful of her friends in comparison. She happens to be a really solid, she's got her head on straight and really conservative and solid. She She comes from you guys. and 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 I'm and I'm I'm curious though. Like my husband actually worries about her more because she comes off as like this perfect kid, mm. and so he's like, "What else is happening underneath that?" And we happen to really I love the Enneagram, which is a, a personality assessment test that I love. And she took she took the Enneagram, and she's a, a one, a perfectionist. And so having some of these tools that work for us, we try to instill with the kids, but. There's going to be comparison, especially with social media, especially with other kids being privileged. She doesn't have Instagram yet. She's got TikTok, but it's a private account. So we're, and we're mindful of monitoring screens and, but mainly just empowering her with tools. But Amelia, my husband, really takes the parenting role. Like I get to be bonus mom more than like the one of the main um, disciplinaries in the family. That's fascinating. That's really cool that you guys like own the roles and you're not trying to be all things from each of you. Yeah. That's, that's, I hope people pick up on that. That's really cool. Now, a lot of times we hear that people teach what they need the most. Was there mm-hmm. ever a time or a trigger when it came to money or success or anything that fits in that realm that you were working through yourself yes. that yes. led to you working with other people on this? Yes. So, okay. Great. I love this conversation because I also love being more vulnerable and honest because I feel like we don't do that enough. Mm -hmm. So I became a couples therapist because I saw my parents have a terrible marriage and lovely people and great parents, just not good with relationship. So I unconsciously wanted to help them heal. And then I become a therapist. I worked with over 3000 hours of of couples and got kind of done with couples (laughs) in that year and a half. I was like, okay, I'm done. So there's a lot of work that I want to share because I think it can support couples. I just needed a break from that topic. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to develop around business. I didn't know much as a therapist. I didn't know how to run a business. And so I started investing in masterminds and coaches and learning and was able to put something together. I'm like, Oh, I really love this. But I I wanted to hit the seven figure mark. It felt like this this invisible, this like club of like the seven figure club. There was something in my psychology. Maybe. Yeah. Validation. Yeah, for sure. Validation. But it was like this goal that I had had and it, and it felt like, okay, I'm teaching on when I get there, then what? So what is the there that I want and how do I source that myself? Mm-hmm. And I really worked it and I got pretty good around it, but it was still subconsciously driving me. And when I hit that seven figure mark, it was like nothing had changed. Yeah. It was just, you know, it's like, and it, it was, it was a made up story. Yeah. You know, I could be sitting here in a, $30 chair or a $3,000 chair and no one would know. It was a story in my mind that I had given my power to. And it's sometimes easier to see it in hindsight. You know, you hear a lot of like rich people say, once you get to a certain place, it's not really about those things. And I had even seen my dad do very well. He was a financial advisor. He did very well as a, as a financial advisor, sold his company at 50 and then went a shamanic route. He went towards healing because he was completely disconnected with himself and his happiness. And so I really then focused on happiness first. But as soon as I heard, you know, I really started diving into business in the last five years and my friends were hitting seven figures, some of them, I, there was like this carrot that I needed to go towards. And some of the, the tools definitely helped, but it didn't actually fully drop until I hit it. And I was like, oh, that was silly. And yet I felt like I needed that in some way. It was a goal that I, I wanted to hit. That's so fascinating. Uh, there's so many layers to that. One, you were driven to get there because your friends around you were getting there. So somehow you felt like you needed to get there. So mm-hmm. one could almost look at that like you got there for the wrong reason. But then the other positive side of that is what a powerful testament to if you want to go somewhere that is mm-hmm. rare to get to, mm-hmm. you got to mm-hmm. surround yourself with other people doing it because it's going to trigger you to take the actions to get there. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, the, the funny thing is, is like, you know, I've, I've always been 
I call it generosity based business. Like my mantra is connect and serve. And and I'm and I'm doing better in business on a financial revenue point, but on a profit point, it's not that much more. No. Like you still have you have a bigger team. It did so profit that. margins yeah. matter even. Yeah, people don't realize that. <laughs> and so I think, you know, and my friends used to laugh because I had 90% profit margins yeah. running an, a business without doing online marketing. And then now online marketing, it's it's different. I have to relook at what it is, but it's 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 different because you have to do team and ads and all the other things or affiliates. But it's like if your mission and your if you're aligned with it, beautiful and like you'll keep growing. And for me, coaching and mastery and service, it's like the one goal I never want to end. Mm-hmm. I love growth. I'm addicted to growth. It's one of my core values, and my business has doubled every year. But I I genuinely want to keep learning facilitation in a way to to open hearts and touch and t- you know open minds and hearts like that is that's the core thing yeah. and and if, if i get out of alignment with that and i watched my dad do that and use money as the goal i think that we life gives us feedback to yeah. course correct to come back into alignment and it's so innocent either way if the ego kind of pulls us in who we think we need to be at a certain level i'm so honest. curious were you happier when you had 90% profit margins making good money or now when you're making extraordinary money, <laughs> but your profit margins are obviously much lower because you said yourself, teams, Facebook ads, affiliates, everything else yeah. that comes along with it. Which yeah. which place were you happier? You know, it's it, as I love at the time, I it was huge for me, you know, to be profiting at that first year of coaching, profiting three hundred thousand and and like doing really well. And I was really happy at the time. I'm also really happy now, mm-hmm. but I'm working a lot more. Mm-hmm. So where I was working maybe 15 hours a month, I'm working a full I'm working much more full time now, like 8 hours a day. And so I think if I was, I'm a, if I had stayed at that place anywhere if I stay, I'm not as happy as if I'm growing. Uh, there's so, the answer that I have for myself too by the way. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It, it wasn't like, about like being happier with less or you know being unhappy that I work more. It's that I have to be moving the needle to be happy. Yeah. I love creating. I love service. I love growth. So if I'm... So growth, truth, service, connection, and love are my top five values. If I'm expressing those in all areas of my life, I'm fulfilled. Mm. And I was reflecting on... So meaning I go to the gym, I do group fitness because I love connection. I incorporate service into my business because that's part of my core value. And when I sold an online course, my my business doubled, but I wasn't as fulfilled because I wasn't connecting with my clients. So I started doing masterminds again. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I love this. I get to grow, reach more people and serve. But now I get to drop in and really see them change their lives. Like That fulfills me. And other people are more... You know, entrepreneurial and product based. They want to just, you know, see things scale as numbers, and that's beautiful too. But you have to do what's aligned for you. Yeah. And for me, I, um, I that was a pivot that I came back to. And so, um, yeah, I, I feel like I was reflecting on it. And this is, I've met, I've had every goal that I've ever wanted in my life, I've hit at this moment. Wow. And so I feel really grateful and I see what's next, but it feels fun to envision what I'm stepping into next. Yeah. And what is next? I don't, I don't feel push a book. Oh, sweet. Awesome. Yeah. Make sure you hit yeah. us up when, when, when you tackle that. We learned a lot doing Lori's book. Okay, great. Love to share Thank, it. You. Thank you. I would love, I would love support with that. Yeah. Book and training coaches, how to be a powerful coach. You're, really you're going to be it. creating a certification program, right? Yeah. I love, yeah. tell me a little bit about that. Cause while I love that everybody's empowering themselves to make money and, and be a coach, I also feel like there's a responsibility to be a good coach and to learn what you're doing. I agree. And so I love that I you're agree. putting together a certification program around it. Tell us about it a little bit. Yeah. So it'll be really coaches that want to either up-level their game or get certified. So there's a track to get certified. And there's another for coaches that just want to be masterful at their craft. I think some of us just want to keep growing and learning and and becoming the best at what we do. And I think that there's going to be a a assessing point where the coaching industry tips around who's really good are the ones that continue. And I want to make sure that coaches are doing transformative work, really doing the work that they're here to do and changing the world. So half of the program will be around coaching mastery and the skills to do that, both starting with ourselves first and then being able to facilitate that change in our clients. And then the other half is business mastery. So really teaching them how to grow a business, whether it's from zero to six figures, that's one track, or six figures and beyond because there are different 
business tracks depending on what you enjoy. And I've seen having done this work for 17 years, what you actually need step by step. So what's the easiest, most intelligent, graceful path towards building a business? So it'll be part, it'll be very experiential, but half business mastery and half coaching mastery. People are silly. I guess I feel bad just painting a broad stroke of the brush like that. But people are silly if they don't go get this kind of help. Like if they don't get certification or training or something because they're taking the long, slow, painful route by figuring it out on their own and making mistakes that people like you could save them. And you know what I mean? Like just go get the training, go get the coach, go get the... It's the faster, more enjoyable route. Trust me. I I know. And I used to be the person who was like, oh, I can do it on my own or I'll figure it out. And I think sometimes people look at what they're spending rather than what they're making and what they're saving by doing. You know, And I will now always be doing... As a coach, I'm always upping my game because I know that the better I do in my life, the more I can serve my clients. And so I'm always going to be investing in a coach or a program or a training or something because I, I love it. And I think it's the best work in the world as I enhance the quality of my life. I can then serve my clients in doing the same. And it's, I just feel really blessed to get to do this work. Is the coaching industry oversaturated? I don't think so. I think we need way more people doing this work, but leading with themselves first. It's no longer about telling people what to do. It's about being a, a model, embodying our, our, our authentic leadership, and then inviting those who can see us into doing the same for themselves. And so I think we need more people doing this work. Um, mm. I would agree. I would, I would totally yeah. agree with you. Now, you run in a spiritual community. I guess yeah. you can define it better than, than me if you want, but I would call it a, a spiritual community. You'll see where I'm going with this question. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, so feel free to correct me, but I would deem you a, a very spiritual person, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And one thing I've noticed in the spiritual community, let's, you know, I want you to picture yoga teachers and Reiki healers, and, and it's just like everyone in that, they are like martyrs. They are so afraid to ask their worth. They are so afraid to, to make any real money. What's behind that and how can we fix that? That's a great question. I think a lot of... There's a religious, spiritual line of energy that has thought that I need to suffer to make money or it's bad to create wealth. And I love that part of your work is shifting that paradigm because it's absolutely not going to be of service if we're not taking care of ourselves And we can do more when we have more. And so it's more our consciousness than our wallets, right? And so as we shift our consciousness, we can then obviously be a more beneficial presence in the world. So I think we're kind of waking up out of that. But I think there's a lot of money myths and I'll bust a few of them. So people think, charge what you're worth. Mm -hmm. And our worth is inherent. Mm -hmm. We are priceless. Our services, on the other hand, are not. Mm. And so we could never charge what we're worth and we don't deserve it, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. Our de- we, that is in, in like what, how much we make and who we are is separate. So really getting that on a deep level. Part of the work that I do is around bringing consciousness into money, really get using everything to get free. And money happens to be a big one that people aren't really closely looking at because it's, it's a touchy topic for people. And so another one is people say, I hate asking for money. Mm-hmm. But we never actually ask for money. We state our fees and people are empowered to say yes or no. That's ah. it. If we think we're asking, we're going to feel disempowered. Yeah, With like dad or God or somebody outside of us, can I have this? It's disempowering versus owning our professionalism and embodying our power and leading with service and then inviting those who we feel like we can support into a package or into a conversation about our services. And I think that's one of the most loving things we can do if... And this is what we were talking about earlier around sales conversations. If there's something we know can, that can support somebody and we're coming from a very clean place, like I, don't, I know I never need a client. That scarcity mindset is toxic. It creates a lot of icky energy and people are... Not only you don't feel good about it, but your potential clients don't feel good about it either. And so I need a client. I would slow that down and question that you ever need a client. For one, you don't need them mm-hmm. and get take your power back. Trust the universe is friendly, that you're going to align. There's nothing that you could do to make somebody be your client, nor would you want to be in that kind of a dynamic. Yeah. But there's also nothing that you could do that, that would have somebody that's meant to work with you not work with you. Mm-hmm. you, can, you so there's a great... And I call it surrendered action. Taking action and letting go. And there's a way that you can be a powerful force and be a professional and use these principles to support you not only in becoming more free, but actually serving on a deeper way. So the I need a client, 
you, there's plenty of people to support and work with, but you could, you also are empowered to have other options. You can do another profession. You can get a side hustle as you're building and getting coaching to stabilize this new revenue source. Mm. So you've got options. You don't need anyone, but anything that limits us and contracts us is a breadcrumb to our freedom if we use it that way. I want to have that sales conversation quick. It's like you keep giving me the perfect sideways. Yeah. So if people remember to be in the interview, I said, what's something generous that you've done recently? And you said, I just got off a sales call, right? And mm-hmm. again, people mm-hmm. would think, wait, that's not generous. That's you receiving the money. That's you making the sale. Yeah. And then I want to piggyback to that. Uh, you just said that we can't make somebody do something that they don't want to do, or we can't make someone work with us who isn't aligned to work with us. And yet, if I'm being transparent, I feel like I can close anyone if I try hard enough. And I actually, <laughs> you and I were talking offline, I enjoy this challenge of closing people. And, and it's like a dopamine hit to the point where it's got me in trouble yeah. before, right? We had a really transparent yeah. conversation about that. So why is sales actually an act of generosity? I loved that you love phrased that. it that way. And yeah. t- talk to me a little bit more about this weird thought I have around... I feel like I could get people yeah. to work with me that are not aligned to. And I feel like I accidentally have in the past. Yeah. Okay, great. So the first one, sales is, is, is around generosity is because I'm coming from a place that's so clean. So I am taking a call to be of service to somebody. I actually don't see them as sales conversations. I see them as opportunities to serve and coach. Mm. Now I'm going to use money or I'm going to use what... So I'm always looking at what is it that they desire and where are they blocked and then giving them a taste of... I'm actually in my sales process, I'm giving them an experience of moving through a block because not only is that of service to them, and I know that if they do want to move forward, that's going to support them in taking steps, whether it be coaching with me or doing something else. I'm not attached to it, but I'm showing up in my fullness to serve them. Mm -hmm. And I also know that always comes back. So I'm there 100%. And, I, and I, I really get the conversation. So I'm there for them. And this is their time. And I'm genuine about it. And if they, if they want to move forward, but say maybe money is an issue or they have to talk to their partner, I have been trained and I know what's worked with me to really coach on the deeper thing because I, like you, feel very confident in my sales ability. Yeah. But so people, I think we can have really good skills around training and get better conversion rates and, um, and whatnot. But everything is a learning opportunity. So maybe you let people in, but then you learn like, oh, that wasn't necessarily... I wouldn't say it was a mistake. I would say that you both got to learn from that because you could never make somebody do something they don't want to do. Yeah. That's, they're empowered to make choices and so are you. Yeah. And, and, the, and I, you know, the more we get to say, this isn't a fit, but here's what I think would be a fit. Oh, it feels so clean and it serves them. And they may be referring people. They feel so grateful or they come back when they're really ready. Right. And so, um, in terms of, you know, having somebody join a program that they shouldn't have, I would, I've questioned that. And, and it's not been my experience. I think there was a learning for both parties in that. And if you got the learning, you don't need life to keep showing you, testing you and showing you that lesson. Oh, that's interesting. So we were meant to work together, even though it didn't work out well. Because we were meant to learn that lesson. And I would question that it didn't work out well. Yeah, I actually worked out perfectly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. Because you learned the lesson. Yeah, good, and if you didn't correction. learn the lesson, you just keep getting the tests. Yeah, that's so fascinating. That's true for life. How come other people are so hung up around sales? They're so afraid to ask for I the think sale. that they're, they're making it about themselves. Yeah. And then they feel greedy or they, they really are in scarcity mindset. And so before I do any type of sales training, I'm going to mindset first. Again, inside and then out. So if they're clear and they're really powerfully showing up from an abundance, service-oriented way, oh my God, it feels amazing. And ironically, your potential clients feel great. And not and it also helps with sales, mm-hmm. ironically, as you let it go. Because I will tell people, I, my sense is you're not really coachable or you're not really ready. And that's totally fine. But I'd rather us have an honest conversation because I don't want you to move forward in something that you're not 100% behind. Yeah. And I will tell people... You know, from a one to a 10, how ready do you think you are? 10 being the strongest. And if they say eight or below, I don't take them on as a client and I tell them why. And I've actually had people lean in to be like, wait, wait, wait. I actually, I said seven because of this. And then, and then that's fine. Right, now I'm because, a nine because you denied me. <laughs> right, exactly. And, that, and I don't want to play psychological games. And I was a therapist. I know how to do that. But you don't want to have that kind of energy 
for six months or a year, however long you're working with somebody. And it does get people that were on the fence to go all in. And you want to work with people that are hungry and all in because mm-hmm. that's what's going to get them results. And so you want to support their fire and yeah. their aliveness. I love that. I, I always teach that sales, like to be really good at selling is a loving act because you're interrupting people's poor patterns of decision making by being able to sell them into a decision that's good for them that they would normally not choose to make. That's you know? 100% accurate. And, so and it really I, does and come I, from a good place. That's right. Absolutely. And I find a lot of women, more so than men, hang up on self-doubt. Hmm. And so if I see that that's one of their blocks, I'm going to coach them to a yes or a no on my call with them as an act of love. Yeah. And I have, I have celebrated women's and, and men's no's mm-hmm. because that maybe I was the only one that was like, good for you for saying no. Yeah. Now you know what your truth is. What are you going to do from here? And I'll give them homework. Yeah. And they're like, you're not, you know, the coaching began when they signed, when they, when I signed up for a call with them, I'm not going to withhold my coaching just because they haven't, you know, signed up yeah. for something. I'm going to show up. And so coaching them to a yes or a no, so they don't deepen the pattern of doubt serves them in their life. So that, mm-hmm. and I was actually, you know, some really pe- the people that I'm thinking of really successful people that I've looked at in our community. And I'm like, what makes them so successful? Mm-hmm. And one of the core traits that I saw was being bold and decisive, Yeah, taking bold, decisive action. I was like, that is something I can learn because I used to really struggle with self-doubt. Mm-hmm. And so I've cleaned it up less gray in my life and more black and white. Whereas I know some other women have a lot of black and white and they're looking at a little bit more gray so they don't just um, make impulsive decisions because it's never about being an impulse buy. But it is around when it's a deep yes for you, it does, even if it doesn't make sense in our mind to trust that. It mm-hmm. always worked out for me when I have. That is so cool. I love that. Being conscious of your time, I, I want to steer the conversation quickly to generosity because it's the whole purpose of this show, right? Like helping people create this tool called money so they can actually go do good shit with it. So... What causes excite you right now? Mm, homelessness. Um, I'm actually behind a, an organization every year. I've got a nonprofit with some of my girlfriends called Sister Society, and we support one organization. And right now we're doing it's called Hustle 2.0 mm-hmm. Prison Reform, mm-hmm. um, which is a great organization. But um, so I love I love I love service and whatever lights people up, and I'm behind. But also homelessness, really helping people. There's so many organizations that I love, but homelessness is a big one. We are seeing it explode in our neighborhood right now, mm-hmm. like we have never seen before. Why do you think that is? And, and what can we do from our part, you know, to do our part? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's because we have the train that comes into the beach. And like, if you're going to be homeless, why not be on the beach? Like, yeah. that's what I would do. Um, but I think there's... Um, Pastor Ron is here locally. So I know of some of the local organizations and he's here support he he hands out a power bar and with on the on the beach every morning and gives them a shower. And I, I don't I think people think it's gotta be a grand thing. Like if they have money, great, support with money, but it doesn't have to be that. I think look at people in the eye mm-hmm. and see their heart beyond even if because you know with homelessness i think one third is uh, mentally off another third are newly homeless and another third actually i don't know if it's a third that are choosing it but they've been homeless for a while and so look look people in the eye smile like honor their humanity i think in even in prison and even in homelessness like across the board we are all the same equally the same and to honor somebody's dignity and really see them even if you can't get them a bite to eat or if you can't, you know, if you don't want to give them money, you can offer them a meal. I think do what feels right in our heart and don't underestimate the act of a small kindness even yeah. just today. Oh, I absolutely love that. Have you ever come across Lunch on Me uh, started by no. Lorea? Oh, uh, no. okay. Outside of here, I'll, I'll have to uh, turn you on to her, her cause. She has done more for um, Skid Row down here than probably anyone I can name. She literally went and voluntarily lived there as one of them with no advantages, wow. didn't take money down or anything for 42 days and documented it. So she could learn like what's really going on. Isn't that nuts? Wow. And she's our age. So I could imagine I would, just interrupting I would your life for 42 connect. days and going and living on Skid Row. I would love to connect with her. Yeah, she's Thank incredible. You. She's really cool. Lunch on me. Great for her. Good for her. Good All right, work. So where can we follow you and find you? You can find me at alistanobriga.com, my website, or on Instagram, Facebook, all the things. Very cool. All right. Uh, Last question I ask everybody, and it's this. Give me a reason why people should be unapologetic about their pursuit of success. 
Because as you're serving yourself, you serve the world. Mm. I love that. Like right to the point. Some people take that and run with it. That is just like right to the point. When you're serving yourself, mm-hmm. you're serving the world. That's I right. I freaking love that. I love it. It's right, got to start with us. Yeah, it really does. Yeah. Alyssa, That's thank what you. creates that martyr syndrome. If we're doing it for somebody else and we don't even know if it's connected to them, but if we're taking care of ourselves, we're going to overflow with generosity. That's our, that's our nature. Mm. We're just, there's kindness at our core. Yeah. And we need to show that more. Like yeah. lead by example and let it trickle down to other people. That's right. That's crazy. Yeah. Alyssa, speaking of kindness at the core, that's you for being on the show, for coming to, to teach at my mastermind a couple of days ago. You're just an absolute extraordinary human being and, and I'm blessed to know you and, and blessed to call you a friend. I feel the same. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for being on. Thanks for listening. And if you loved this episode and know of someone else who is as successful as they are generous, please pass them on to me. It would mean the world to me if you help me get this cause and this message out to as many listeners as I can. So please, if you liked what you heard, it goes a long way if you take 30 seconds and leave me a five-star review and share this with your friends. I'll be forever grateful. And until the next episode, cheers to your success.